Um, again, really appreciate everybody that's here, and I'm going to kind of back clean up on a number of different areas, finish up some research trials, and also give some other program updates and some other activities. First thing you want to, on your seats, there's a printout. We do two public events, a larger public events. Swine Day is one. Our Swine Profitability Conference is the other one. That's always the first Tuesday in February. The program lineup is set, um, and you can see that. Really encourage you to come back. That program um, is really focused on the business aspects of our swine producers, our Kansas producers outside of Kansas. Uh, the banking industry, allied industry, and again, generally we have about 125 or so attendees at that. You'll see the program, tremendous lineup of people uh, that we got from all across the country being able to come in and talk about business management and spending the afternoon on some of the biosecurity disease, disease drivers. Uh, Daniel Luers at Iowa State's done a tremendous job with database management and looking at, and then also Steve will wrap up uh, with some of his experiences as we conclude that program. So to get to the last research updates, when else can you get literally 200 slides in less than two hours, right? Our goal is that. It's to provide the information. The full research reports are online. The abstracts you have when you got here, we encourage you to go and look at that as you have one additional information in each one of these areas. The first study I want to briefly touch on is some manganese research. When is the last time anybody has sat down and thought, man, I really want to know what the manganese requirement of these pigs are and where I adjust my premix, right? But these are the things that are important because when's the last time that we've really looked at levels of a lot of our trace minerals in the premixes? They get set. Josh Flores, when he was in grad school, did an industry survey many of you were part of uh, that looked at levels of all the different trace minerals and vitamins and premixes. Uh, Micronutrients has a newer product that they've developed. They wanted to look at that in diets and compare it to our typical source of manganese sulfate. And so again, the goal of this was to look at different levels, six, or 8, 16, and 32 ppm, the NRC requirement sits down here at 2 to 4, okay? Pretty typical industry levels may have in that 20 to 30 range for this particular trace mineral and a lot of premixes that we did the survey on. So really at the end, we look at the two different sources on ending body weight. We can see there was a quadratic effect. And this is back to, well, what does this mean? This is one of some of the data you get back sometimes and you look at, you did a titration, shouldn't there be some sort of potential linear response? I think here's a good case where you look at both sources. We had from the 8, they both dipped down at 16, and both went back up to the 32. I think what this also tells us is all these mineral interactions. We've talked yesterday, we had a couple different groups, and we talk about these mineral interactions all the time and how little we know about it. So if we have something that isn't going well, just add more, right? Well, then it screws something else up. So my question is, and we don't know, is there something at that level that's interacting and, you know, again, why we saw it, but it was interesting, both sources produce that same effect at that same level. And again, as we looked at the highest, you know, again, not consistent exactly how the response was between sources, but again, as we look at that, how do we take this information, what's next steps, how do we look at what's in our diets, and then where do we need to go with some of this trace mineral work, because it is very challenging. Do we have unintended consequences on levels we set that we think are fine based on a very limited amount of data in some of these areas. One thing we do is say, well, did we screw the diets up, right? Those pigs in the middle didn't do as well. Well, when you go in and actually do the testing of the liver to know what is the concentration, in fact, as you look at the concentration, regardless of source went up. So that confirms that the diets, and by doing the testing of the diets, they, we met our targets. When you feed more of minerals, they're going to retain more, right? And so again, here was a case where we increased, and again, the question is, as we start to accumulate trace minerals, is that a good thing? Does that start to interact with other trace minerals? Again, a lot of unknowns in some of these areas, but something for us always be considering, and those in this area, there's still always a lot of information need to be generated. Going to switch topics to the xylanase. Xylanase is an enzyme that uh, can be used, or the, its mode of action is basically to go and break up, uh, hopefully potentially make some of the carbo undigestible carbohydrate fractions of our diets more digestible, release, potentially release more energy, get a growth performance. More recently, there's been more information done on a larger scale that's tried to target mortality. Again, there's different reasons that we can get into and different theories on, on a gut level basis that potentially that feeding xylanase is helping at a gut barrier level that's potentially helping with 
quote unquote gut health, we like to throw that term around again, and potentially decreasing mortality. There's some large databases that have shown this. There's been some others that have not. Sometimes it depends. If you're at a higher level of mortality because of gut issues, you may have a more opportunity to see it than if you're in a low mortality. So this is kind of an area that uh, we wanted to explore with uh, Jeffo approached us. We looked at different levels of their enzyme in a commercial environment. There's just over 2,000 pigs. We did this up at New Horizon Farms. If we look at final body weight as we look across, no statistical differences. And this was fed on top. So we didn't go in and make deficient diets. We didn't back off loading values. These diets were formulated to meet their nutrient requirements, so this just went in. So necessarily we did not expect a difference in growth because of the fact we weren't trying to formulate to try and tweak. So it went on top. If there was a benefit, we could have seen that, but again, fairly level across. On feed efficiency, same way, no differences as we look across the different levels. Then ultimately we get to mortality. The one thing we know with mortality is we need a lot of numbers. There's, I think, 22, 2,300 pigs in this study. The reality is we, we wanted to measure it. We probably need a lot more. If you look at the numbers across, generally we're just over we're the 3 to 4% level. For some reason at the high level, that went up. Again, we can't explain that, whether that's just variation or if there was something real there. But again, I think as we look in general, we're probably in a level of mortality, whether a xylanase will have a major impact versus maybe something a little higher. Again, we probably need more numbers when we get into measuring the response criteria of mortality. Going to transition now into a few different phytase trials. This is the one I'm going to spend probably the most time on, and it really deals with the use of higher levels of phytase fed at different times. Okay? So oftentimes we're in the nursery, we're super dosing levels that we call it. That's generally 1,500 to 2,000. FTUs per kilogram inclusion. Sometimes we run that through nursery into beginning finishing and we often find a fairly consistent response in nursery. Most, I would say in most systems we're super dosing phytase and getting a growth response above what we would expect from just the regular diet uh, from the phosphorus release. Much less consistent in finishing. Okay? What we want to do in this study is, is as we feed higher levels early and potentially pull out and, and only use in the grower versus all the way through. But also one thing unique we did with this study was to put loading values on the phytase itself for not only calcium and phosphorus, but for the amino acids and energy as well. There's been digestibility studies done with a lot of the phytase sources trying to determine what extra amino acids, what extra energy do we get from feeding phytase as it breaks down phytate, other things become available and the pig has the potential to use those amino acids and energy. So this is an example of for this particular phytase, the manufacturer recommendations, again, at the 1500 level for the available phosphorus, calcium. We get into the energy. That 24 kcals on an ME basis is similar to about 30 pounds of fat, okay? So when we get into these diets, we backed off about 30 pounds of added fat when we fed these levels of phytase compared to the control. There's also adjustments on the amino acid side. So what did the pigs tell us? This is after the first phase, day uh, 0 to 57 in finishing. Again, both of these diets, pigs, would have re been receiving the high level of phytase with the nutrient loading values at that time compared to the control. As you look on a feed efficiency basis, what happened? Pigs did worse. So what does that tell us? During this phase, we were overcrediting the probably energy or and or amino acid levels given to phytase because they're on a feed efficiency basis they got poor. Now we do the second, the last half of finishing. Again this diet, these pigs went back to the control in yellow they were still remained on the higher phytase with the full loading values. And again in that case feed efficiency was worse, probably some sort of overestimation of those. If we look at average daily gain overall, these pigs that were fed the high phytase of the grower actually compensated during the finish. If you remember some of Mike's talk, but again, remember, they weren't deficient, but overall they were able to come back. These pigs were not. And then from a feed efficiency standpoint, if we gave loading values throughout, again, their feed efficiency was worse. It was not statistically different than the control, but intermediate when they were just had those loading values for the first half of finishing. 
So what happens on a cost basis? So why do producers, why do feed nutritionists, why do people look at putting loading values on phytase? It's to lower feed costs because if you have that energy release, you can decrease soybean meal or your protein source. You can decrease added energy through added fat if you're using added fat. And there's a feed cost savings. However, if you look across here, there's no statistical differences. So we could conclude whatever you do is fine. But again, if you want to dig in on numerical values, it would cost about a dollar per pig to give those phytase values throughout. While there was a feed cost reduction, it took more feed to get in there because feed efficiency was worse and they were also lighter. When we gave just during the grower phase, again, very similar uh, in that regard. So we wanted to follow this study up with a, with a second study after seeing that, looking at uh, uh, providing different release values for just calcium and phosphorus, calcium phosphorus or the amino acids. Then we came in, so treatment five we'll jump to, would basically be the same type of approach we had in the first study. But in treatment four, we just did half the release suggested on a net energy basis. So we still gave the credits for the other minerals, amino acid, but just half of the energy. Because of the feed efficiency challenge we saw, that's most likely where we felt the feed efficiency worsening was coming from. This was a little shorter study, from 63 to 160 pounds of body weight. Maddie Wensley was involved um, in this study. So we really get to the feed efficiency during, again, the, the, this, the 55 days. What you'll see is, again, on our control diet, when we gave the calcium and phosphorus amino acid releases, okay, again, no statistical difference. We gave half. Again, it gets a little bit worse on feed efficiency again, but no statistical. But when we gave the full, what happened? 207 versus the 202. So again, repeated, when you give the full values, we were not able to achieve that feed efficiency balance. Interestingly, here on the end, this is the control diet, okay, with the added phytase on top of its values that we never gave any credit for back. So we didn't decrease monocal, we didn't adjust the, the protein source. And again, not different, but again, numerically going lower, which you would maybe think if, again, if we're releasing a little bit more energy, okay, are we incrementally picking up? So again, we're, we're cutting fine hairs on numerical differences, and we need to be careful of that. But again, I think we just, the bottom line is we just got to be careful how we're using the loading values for phytase in different cases. And that becomes important for producers, those that are working with nutritionists, how is that being used, okay, and how that may or may not be impacting your bottom line. Feed cost savings is present, but are we going to cost performance, and at the end, where is our net value? One of the studies also this last year, we did a, two different uh, experiments to help develop a new, new equation for a predicted release of a new phytase source that's entered the market this last year in the U.S. Um, this is the Smyzyme product uh, from Origination. And the bottom line is, off of the two different studies we did in the, uh, the nursery period, the first study was from 150 to 1,000 FTUs per kilogram. The second study we did was from 250 to 1,500, so a little higher on the top side. When we combine this data, we were able to generate release values for every FTU inclusion on a gain, feed efficiency, or defatted bone ash percentage. And really the bottom line of this product is, as we compare it to other phytase sources on the market, it compares very similar when we analyze on an AOAC basis and put everything on an equal FTU basis. Again, some uh, products have different FTUs depending on how they do their internal. When we do it on an equal basis, this uh, phytase was very similar release at the different levels than what we see in some of our other products that are on the market today. Along with some of the phosphorus work, uh, Karini, uh, is, who was part of our PhD program, now works with PIC. She was on a, a fellowship sponsored by PIC, and she helped develop, she did a lot of phosphorus requirement work as part of her degree program. The, one, the bottom line from all of that work was, if you compare to the NRC, the NRC on a percentage basis on formulation is probably 20 to 30 percent too low in terms of the phosphorus requirements on a standardized digestible basis. But on a grams per day basis, it's basically spot on. So what that says is, is in, in the NRC, they use a feed intake 
that's higher than what we're achieving in the field, so we need to make sure that we have the appropriate level of phosphorus we're formulating to in your diets, okay? Grams per day, it's amazing how we come back to that, and we can get very predictable, okay? So knowing feed intake. What we're able to do with, with her work, and she helped develop basically an economic tool based on different levels of uh, standard digestible phosphorus to help develop what is the most economical. This is a published paper. There's a DOI number. But this will be also available on our uh, KSU Swine.org website, available for use to look at different diets and try and determine um, economics. The last uh, phytase slides I want to get to is we, there's been some work that's been done looking at super dosing levels in lactation. Again, most of the work with superdosing or feeding high levels above that of what we'd expect from a phosphorus and calcium release has been done in nursery pigs and in grow finish. There's some, there was a small, smaller study uh, that was available that really tried to target farrowing duration, going after stillbirths, okay? And some of the thought process there is if there was extra some energy release or looking at some of the metabol metabolism that's going on on a high level of, of phytase use, they're actually seeing some decrease in the, the amount of time it took from the first pig to the last pig out, okay? So we did this at our K-State farm. Uh, Kelsey Batson, who's working on her master's, was involved in this study, and we used either 0, 1,000, or 3,000 FTU of the Ronazyme Hyphos product. If we look at farrowing duration, kind of the, one of the main response criteria we were trying to go after, talk about labor-intensive work, all right? If you're going to record when the first pig comes out and the last pig comes out, um, somebody's there. This isn't done with cameras. And very, uh, again, credit to the grad students and Kelsey and all them for getting this organized. Very labor-intensive over multiple groups at our K-State farm. Again, no statistical differences. But again, as we look at a numerical, as we increase the amount of, of phytase, there was a decrease in the total duration. What this also tells us is, is while we had, um, I believe, around 100 sows or so on this, uh, we need to increase numbers, um, and maybe we can tease that out a little bit more. But again, not statistical, but those numbers were corresponding with some of the initial work that we saw in, in a trial that was published previously. If we look at overall litter weight gain, again, there was a quadratic effect. Um, again, when we saw, when we started to feed the higher levels uh, at 1,000, uh, slightly down at 3,000, so there was no negative consequences of feeding the higher uh, phytase levels in lactation. Again, very limited amount of data um, in this area in general. I think an opportunity for uh, researchers and, and companies to help understand this lactation area a little bit further. Okay. Another study that we get involved with, again, is looking at just different pro growth promoting type of additives. And again, there's a lot of different products available, and one of those that we worked with uh, was looking at, in a grow finish study, looking at an algae clay complex. And what the goal here was, was to take a diet that was corn, soy, added fat, so a very high digestibility, met requirements, pigs would perform very well on. We also then took a diet that contained 30% distillers, no added fat, slightly lower in amino acids, total amino acids to have a slightly deficient model in lower energy. So the goal is to separate two different diet types and then also see if this type of additive, how it interacts or does it act differently. Because we talk about highly digestible diets and maybe an opportunity for a lot of our additives not to work as well if we already have pigs growing fast, digesting that diet well versus something that's a little lower digestibility or quality in general. Really the bottom line is as we looked, um, yeah, pigs like a diet that meets their requirements and is fed with some added fat and high amino acids. You look at the difference between the high versus the low, uh, fairly substantial difference in that same growing period. But also in this you can see we had a tendency for the product, whether it was in a high nutrient diet or a lower nutrient diet, we're able to improve the final body weight approximately two to three pounds. And so again, a product that we need, that probably needs further investigation, some really good initial work here to show that, again, as we look at some of the, the potential for growth promotion, um, this product was, uh, again, it was a tendency, but we were able to get two to three pounds regardless of diet type with this particular product. Okay, that is the last data you're going to have to digest, all right? So the next thing, I have a few slides and as we wrap up, uh, talking about a couple other program updates. 
One of the things that we did over the last year and a half is our swine nutrition guide, uh, we wanted to keep current. It had been about 12 years since we had updated this. Like most universities, these things are monsters to update, and many just simply have went away at other institutions. Um, the National Swine Nutrition Guide, uh, we were involved with about, it's almost 10 years ago now. Uh, that's getting outdated. There really hadn't been, other than some genetic company uh, summaries, um, updates. And so what we did, something unique with our swine nutrition guide, is we put this on as two different preliminary exam projects. Okay? So Mariana, who graduated this last summer, she worked and really completely revamped um, the, the general nutrition principles and nursery nutrition principles. Um, Hayden Williams took the challenge of updating the sow and the finishing. And through that, we generated in general nutrition and nursery nutrition. These are live on our website now. They came about uh, three, month, three, four months ago. They went live. A fact sheet form of 13 fact sheets in general nutrition, eight fact sheets in, in nursery, sow five, and finishing eight. And what we wanted to do there was take in, go into the literature, find all the updates that are possible, come up with some standard information available for producers and nutritionists to use. Uh, these are in their final revision stages. We hope to have those up over the next month or so. I suppose if faculty would get everything reviewed as much, right, Hayden? Um, but we're in the final stages of those, and we're really proud of those two students taking on that challenge. And they learned a lot, and it really helped our program get those uh, put in place. The one thing, and Jason talked about this morning, we've talked about before, we're very fortunate to be part of a large national product, uh, project funded by the National Pork Producers, as well as FR, uh, that's a five-year project joint with Iowa State and uh, Kara Stewart at Purdue. The goal of this study, it's a $2 million funded study over five years, solely focused on reducing mortality in our swine industry. And this is through any aspect, any means necessary. Nutrition, management, health, what have you. We're just completing our first year. There's been a lot of, of work that's been done. And again, as, as we look at this is a, well, we view this as not just three universities. We're just going to start, and we've talked with cooperating partners, summer internships. For you in production systems, if you want to be part of this, okay, we don't see this as a five-year project. Our goal is this is an ongoing, long-term. Uh, it's not acceptable in our industry that 33% of the animals produced never make it to market. If you go from birth to market, our industry averages around 33% of the pigs are dead. Okay? You and your businesses wouldn't throw out 33% of the nutrition products you make. You wouldn't throw away 33% of the metal and the equipment, all those things. We have to do better. And so the goal of this project is to hopefully start to gather information. And we, want, we need partners. And that's where the industry comes into play, uh, whether that's through cooperative research projects and part of a consortium. Um, and one thing that we're going to do a year, basically a year from now, 11 months, is we're pulling together what we're going to call an international survivability conference. For those that were part of the feed efficiency international conferences, that we had a couple of those a few years back. Our goal here um, is to pull together experts from all over the world in the U.S. and come away with what are we going to do when we go home. Our goal of this isn't to have a bunch of lectures of here's what's going on and yep, I just... It's actionable items to go home and, and what can we do back in our production systems? What do we need to do on an innovation side, nutrition, health, whatnot? And so again, we encourage you to get those, uh, kind of hold the dates. More information will be coming out that. And again, it's a joint project across multiple universities and pork board to help put this on. And we'd really like input in, in your attendance and uh, you'll be getting more information on that. But use this more as a hold the date at this point in Omaha.